and and do a quick seating thing. My name's Paul, by the way. If everybody's like, who's this jerk talking about seating? Um, if you have a seat next to you, please raise your hand. And now I'm going to count down from 30 for anybody who wants to sit in a seat. You have time to come and grab a seat. 30, 29, 28, 27. <laughs> I know, it never works. Like, it never, ever works. OK, OK, we'll get started. All right, um, so you are at Star Garden. And my name is Paul Moore. I do marketing and communication for Star Garden. Uh, and I'm hosting this event tonight. So I'm going to get into explaining a bit about Update Night and what it's all about. Actually, real quick, a uh, quick check. Have you been to an Update Night? Please raise your hand. Just quick, sir. Oh, OK. So if you've not been to an Update Night, would you mind raising your hand? OK, all right, all right, newbies. OK, so I will, I will explain a bit more about what's going on here tonight. Um, but I have, something to sh I have something new to share uh, with, with you, the audience. So, so we made a video. Um, there was, we've, we've shown an animation before that shows like the Star Garden process and how it works. But I was feeling like we really needed something like a, that sort of told the Star Garden story that we could share with people who didn't necessarily know the Star Garden story. So we made a video, and I'm going to share it with you tonight. And it's like, it, it, I mean, this is it's like Sundance. It's the world premiere. You know, the directors might do a Q&A afterward. Um, but I'm going to show it to you guys. So here it goes. Star Garden starts from sort of the basic premise that we actually don't know much at all, that the best way to move forward in, in this crazy world of starting things is to actually start as many things as possible. So, you know, we have our ideas, we have some thoughts, we're going to share those thoughts. We're by no means the final word on these things. To some extent, we're a victim of our own sort of historical success in the, in the Midwest. We're this cradle of industrial production in the United States, where we think business is big, that things are more forecastable than they really are. I think has really been a hindrance to us in thinking about how to get startups going. It's like we lost sight of that fact that every business really started as somebody's project first. There's an urgent feeling today that across many sectors and verticals, the world needs new innovations. Today we're launching a new venture capital fund. In fact, it is a $15 million venture capital fund. It's called Star Garden. Star Garden will invest $5,000 in two ideas every week. The 30-page business plan is not as valuable as we think it is. The best way to figure out if something's working is to, to put it out into the world and see what the world sends back to you. I'm Dominic Sorensen, the owner of Scovo Farms. Uh, we are a premium pepper products company. I love, you know, having a whole fridge full of condiments and sauces and no food in the fridge, so I have to figure out something really cool to do with those ramen noodles and that sauce. Our first product is Everyday Sweet and Spicy Habanero Sauce. It is a sweet and spicy multi-purpose condiment, and kind of the magic to it is we figured out a way to draw back the spiciness of the habanero and leave the flavor behind. With these weekly $5,000 investments, we're just looking for basic information about who you are, what the market is, what your idea is, how it's different. Sitting in a Tree makes wedding website templates for couples who want to share all of their wedding information online. We aim to make websites that sort of match the amount of time and effort that couples put into every other aspect of their big day. Every week we make two $5,000 investments, one of them based on a public endorsement process, one of them we select internally at Start Garden. That public endorsement process lets things in that we wouldn't necessarily have picked ourselves. Reindeer Cam is a, it's a live streaming feed of Santa's reindeer on the internet 24-7. But probably the coolest part is that it brings the magic of Christmas alive and that it shows Santa three times a day. So you can get on there with your kids. You know Santa's coming. You get to see him, feed the reindeer. It's proof positive that Santa's real. Santa goes out every day. Sometimes he's uh, accompanied by his dog, Coco, and sometimes his elf, Wesley, which is usually me. 
With that $5,000 investment, you actually agree to come back within 60 and 90 days to a public event called Update Night and share what you've learned. Since November 1, we have had about 1 million visits to the website. We've sold to date 15,000 apps. Some of the lessons from Ranger Cam are that things that can appear silly are in fact quite interesting when you get to know them. At Update Night, we announce what we're going to continue to invest in, usually at about $20,000, but sometimes $50,000, $100,000, up to $500,000 we can invest in projects. One of my favorite things about Scoville Farms, you proved it's feasible, you can make habaneros delicious, I've tried it. You proved it's viable, you're making it right now off the bat for less than what you're selling it for. You've also proved that it's desirable. What you've done, in my opinion, exemplifies a really great entrepreneur. It's tough to do what you've done. And uh, with that, we're moving forward with the $20,000 investment. Here's another example of, of a product and an offering where design plays a really crucial role. Beautiful execution and beautiful design. The team is really strong and complimentary. Our answer for sitting in a tree is, right, is uh, yes. As an entrepreneur, you only have so many skills and connections that you can make on your own. With Start Garden, it sort of extends the network that you have and the skills that you're able to tap into. You know, as an entrepreneur, you always have these ideas boiling up and you're sitting in your office kind of ruminating every day about how you could make it happen. But having the resource to actually pull it off is the difference between the billion ideas people have every year and then the actual execution. It's kind of an interesting dynamic that Drew and I have that we bring to the table. It's definitely kind of a weird venture that's sort of working out. We don't know what's going to be able to take root here. So we're trying to get exposure to as many ideas as possible to find those things that catch fire. It all starts with an idea. Thank you, thank you. So um, hopefully that helps, hey, back at you. I like that. Um, uh, it helps clarify a bit of what's going on here, what you're about to witness tonight. You saw some footage from some previous events uh, in there. So I'll run through real quick what this whole Start Garden process is all about. Okay, so it begins with this idea that uh, if we fund lots and lots and lots of ideas, so like over 100 a year, um, some of those ideas are going to figure out that they're going to be uh, interesting projects. Some of those interesting projects will turn into interesting businesses, and a handful will actually scale into big global companies. Um, and as a, a venture capital fund, it's those handful that scale into big companies that we actually um, will make our money back on by owning some, some equity in those companies. Uh, so let's start and keep going. So this is the, what we designed in order to make that process happen. So again, you know, like Rick said in the video, uh, two, two ideas a week we fund at $5,000. One of them is one that we pick and one is one that people who come to the website and vote pick, essentially. And then here, I'm going to use the laser pointer. You guys like laser pointers? Look at that. It's technology. Um, <laughs> So tonight we are, for eight of these teams, we're about right here. So they've, got, they've had 60 to 90 days and $5,000 to run out and do a test. We like to call it a test or an experiment. We don't expect people to launch a company with $5,000, but to figure out if they're, if they're onto something, sort of learn more about the opportunity they may be uh, getting into. And so eight presentations tonight will be uh, at the end of this test and, and tonight, we will announce at the end of the night which ones we will continue to fund, usually at $20,000, but we also leave it up to, to the business and the, the amount of speed that they may be running to dictate if we fund more. Uh, and then from there, we can continue to invest up to uh, half a million dollars into a single idea. Well, at that, if we're going to invest half a million dollars, it's really not an idea. It's a proper business at that point. Just FYI. Okay. Um, but we don't just invest financial capital. We see any good investment as an investment of social capital and intellectual capital. This is a dynamic we often see where entrepreneurs can fixate on the fact that they don't have cash. And then the moment they have cash, they realize like, nuts, I don't know the people that I need to know and I don't know the things I need to know. 
in order to get this thing running. So uh, we do a lot of uh, programming here that's classes and learning events and you know events like here where hopefully some of you will meet people that you don't know and you can sort of network and get to know people uh, in the, the ecosystem, which looks kind of like this in an abstraction. Uh, because the Star Garden, we don't necessarily see ourselves as like this um, one-stop entity for growing companies. We realize our team does not have an expertise in all of the different areas that uh, these ideas will come from, so we rely on a, a big network of partners. There's actually a partner wall over there that lists a lot of companies that have committed um, to give time and talent to these projects to help them move along. Um, and so we sort of see ourselves as more of like a central node with a lot of nodes around it rather than, I don't know, the mall. Is that a good, how does that work? We're not the mall. Uh, and and uh, tonight is for you. So this is, this is the point uh, that I'm making that Star Garden, um, we don't see ourselves as uh, so cruel that we would have these teams run out for three months, do experiments, you know, figure out their idea, and then have three minutes to come and pitch to us whether or not we should fund them. So we've been in communication, particularly over the past couple of weeks, with each one of the teams. We have a pretty good idea of uh, what we're going to do, although that can change over the course of an evening. But uh, the presentations are really for you to catch you up on what the company is and what the experiment is they, they did, what they learned, um, and it seems to work out well, I think, for these teams. So uh, everybody did this, who's presenting tonight, basically, you know, is trying to tackle these questions. You know, is, is my idea desirable? Do people like it as much as I think they will? Is it feasible? Does the technology exist that I can actually make this thing happen? And is it viable? Are, what's the potential of me actually, you know, my costs being lower than what a customer would buy it for in that little in-between space generating profit, which would be Definition of viable. Um, upcoming events before we get started. For those of you that don't know, we have other events that happen here. So March 5, oh, Steelcase Advisor Hours. Raise your hand if you're from Steelcase in the room. Oh, those guys. Uh, how's it going? So we have, uh, we, we had this idea, every Tuesday we do advisor hours from two to five, and so we bring in experts from all sorts of different fields. They come, they sit here, anybody who's working on a project, that's many of you in the audience, can come and sit down and chat with people from like intellectual property lawyers to industrial designers to people who run ad agencies to chat about your, your project and what you're working on and get basically advice from them. And so we said, well, what if we did, what if we focused on one company in the area for one advisor hours. So I think we've got five or six people from Steelcase that are coming on Tuesday that represent different fields within the company from so anything from, you know, to give advice on, I don't know, logistics and manufacturing and what's interesting to acquire and, you know, on all sorts of stuff. So anyway, Tuesday, two to five, Steelcase advisor hours. If you're working on a project, you're more than welcome to come. Uh, March 8th, that's Friday next week. Uh, we have a lunch and learn that happens at lunchtime, hence the lunch part of the lunch and learn. And uh, it's, it's a panel that's going to basically discuss how all the different funding options in Michigan and how you can raise capital in Michigan besides Star Garden. Uh, March 12th. Uh, this is a new class. This is actually kind of fun. We usually do like a lean canvas class every month. This is a class that uh, Tom DeVries, who is formerly part of the Amway Innovation Team, has designed uh, that's really about and what are those, testing those most important questions. What's the most important question to figure out if something's desirable, feasible, viable, and then how do you sort of you know, run that test? I think it's, it's going to be a cool class. And then March 14th, happy hour. That is what it sounds like. <laughs> but, uh, but it's really the time where we open up the doors. If you want to come and have a chat about your idea, not everybody feels comfortable submitting their idea to the website right away. You know, the doors are open and there's free booze and you can hang out and chat with us. It's Thursday evenings after work, once a month. Ah, membership. So, uh, we've tweaked membership a little bit. This space, you can have a membership to this space if you want to be, if you're working on a project and you want to hang around, or maybe if you're interested in finding out what's going on with other people's projects. Uh, membership basically means you can come and hang out here and work here if you would like to. It also means that everything is free that I mentioned, like classes, lunch and learns, um, and you might be like, well, hey, it's free to be here at update night. There's actually a really simple reason for that. Um, it turns out we don't have a liquor license and it would be illegal for us to charge you anything to be here. <laughs> <laughs> but if there's a lawyer in the room that can help me around that 
loophole. I'm interested in talking. Uh, so whenever we serve liquor, it's free. When we don't serve liquor, um, we charge non-members. But if you're a member, it's, it's, all, it's all free all the time. Um, oh, and it's $300 per year, about $100 a quarter. It is $100 a quarter. This is for if, if you're you know, an adult. If you're a college student, it's 100 bucks for the year. So it's, it's reasonable, let's be honest. Uh, this is the format of the night. We'll have presentations. Again, eight teams will present. They all have about three minutes to uh, give you their presentation, catch you up on what they've been doing. We'll have about a 20-minute intermission. You can hit the bar again, hang out, talk. And then uh, a subgroup of the Star Garden team will sit up here and we'll give the feedback to all of the teams and announce which ones we will continue to fund. And I want to say, before we get started, thank you to our eight presenters. And this is like, I, I, I feel deeply about this because I, I, no matter what happens tonight, not everybody goes home with you know, more investment, but all of them did something really awesome, which is that they stopped thinking about what they were going to do, and they started doing it for the past two and three months. And some of them have put in a lot of hours, and regardless of what the investment decision comes at the end, they all deserve a big hand for what they've done. Oh, this is a nice thing you can do. Uh, tweet questions to Star Garden if you are a Twitter user. It's a nice thing after the dust settles for these teams to go back on Twitter the next day and take a look at what, um, what people were saying as they were presenting. So it's a little gift you can give to give feedback to these teams and ask some questions. And now we begin. This is the order. Uh, these are the eight teams. Cunable, Marcus Key, Tagged Weddings, Fresh Milled Oats, Route Book, Benefit, the Sherpa, Gaspard Gallery. This is the order they're presenting. It just happens to be the order that they were funded on the website. Um, so it's kind of chronological, if you're wondering how we chose that order. And so let's get things kicked off with Cunable and Mr. John Grace. Hello, my name is John Grace. I'm the founder of Cunable. And I want you all to know I'm looking for a technical co-founder right now. So after Gutenberg came out with the printing press, it took about 75 years for people to figure out what a book was going to be and to look the way that we see books today. And I really think we're in sort of the same period when it comes to digital content today. We're still figuring some things out. And there's some problems. Uh, you don't own digital content, you license it. The people who license it to you, they put requirements. You can't use it the way you want. Uh, you, they may take it away, they may stop doing business and you can no longer access it. And these problems are the problems I wanna solve. So I came to Start Garden with something I called the business hack, which was, hey, we've got this neat idea to get content that's stuck on one platform to another platform, which was, hey, we could, if you wanted to go from your Apple iPhone to an Android phone, we could get your apps to move. And then we started really looking at that and determined it was a long path towards till we could make any money and the publishers weren't interested. So we pivoted and I did some bartering with the consultancy and got a lot of really great information on why people buy ebooks. And ebooks are awesome, I just have to tell you. So it's a $2 billion market, it's been growing 100% a year. Gardner says it's gonna be $17 billion by 2017. And the other really interesting thing is if you wanna have all the ebooks that almost everyone's gonna to wanna to buy, you only have to go talk to five people. You want Android apps? Well, there's 100,000 people to talk to. So having done that, what were we gonna look at? And what popped out of this data and this information was that there was a problem that we thought we could solve that we could make some money, which was authors can't sell their own eBooks. And so we went through that, looked at how to do it, and determined, yes, authors could sell their own eBooks, and if they could dip into the digital revenue stream and we split the retailing money, they could make 333% more per book sold if they've contract with the major publisher like Random House. So we tested a few hypotheses. Uh, they're up there. The first one is, so would consumers be interested in this? So the data that we had says, yes, uh, consumers are interested in buying eBooks. If you look at why people are buying books at Amazon, author websites are as powerful a reason for selling an eBook on Amazon 
as the New York Times bestseller list. That's a pretty big deal. Then we talked to authors, talked to 17 authors, 14 of them were interested, and yes, Stephen King is one of the 14. And we actually got one willing to be a guinea pig, science fiction authors, science fiction author, Kevin J. Anderson, he's got a book out, August, uh, April 30th, and he's willing to be our guinea pig, and if you buy the book from him, he'll throw in a free short story you can't get anywhere else. So we've got his publisher, Kensington, we're talking, we've, we're in contract negotiations right now. He, the CEO of the company is very interested in our test data, is interested in investing, and is also interested in introducing this to their other authors. So right now, what we're looking for is a little more money to go forward and actually test selling eBooks off an author's website. Um, anybody read the Game of Thrones series? Oh, that, the, the fifth book I thought was a real drag. Anyway, um, but I own it. It's an ebook. Okay, so next is Marcus Key, Clint Marcusi, Marcusi, and Zach Fillmore. Where are you? Oh, there they are. I will do. Hi, my name is Clint. This is my partner, Zach. We are from Rocot Company, and our funded project was the Markiski. What the Markiski is, is essentially a slalom board for the water to be used behind boats or at a cable park. And what it does, it combines the sideways stance of a wakeboard with the cutting and carving ability of a slalom ski. What this allows you to do is either have a leisurely ride through the water, or if you like the hardcore cutting and carving, it'll allow you to cut and carve and handle like a slalom ski, as you can see on the video. And I came up with this idea uh, riding a wakeboard, and I realized that there was a, a gap in, in the two water sports between wakeboarding and slalom skiing. I realized that there's not a product out there, so I went online, tried to look, couldn't find it, so I decided to start making them on my own. I brought Zach onto the team, and we decided to apply for funding from Start Garden. And what we did, we made uh, a bunch of different boards. We tested the undercut design of them. We tested materials. We tested a whole bunch of different styles of board. And we brought them down to Florida to have a promotional event there um, to see if other people thought that there was a gap in the market. And I'll let Zach explain the results of that event we held in Florida. So as Clinton mentioned, uh, we held that event in Florida. And we allowed people of all skill levels and ages to try out the board. Um, and what we learned from them is that they loved it. They felt that they were in control, that they could cut clean. Uh, they said it was very easy to get up on, easier than a wakeboard. And, you know, they also said that they were less tired after riding it. Um, another main reason to go down to Florida was functional testing uh, to see which design was best. As you can see, one of them, not the greatest. We won't be moving forward with that one. Uh, <laughs> so we found our two best designs and let everybody try those out. Um, and we got great feedback. Then we obviously wanted to ask if our price point, $400, was comfortable for them. Everybody seemed very comfortable with it. It's right in line with wakeboards and slalom skis in the market now, so that wasn't an issue for anybody. And we were even asked more than 10 times when these would be in stores. So that was evidence to us that there is a gap in the market for this product. Uh, so going forward with this, obviously we'd like to make more boards, get them to the market, um, hold some events in state once the weather breaks and around the country to get some more feedback and see what people think about the product and then obviously start selling. Eventually we want to design it um, better for manufacturability, easier to make, better quality, and obviously cheaper to increase our margins. Thanks. Did everybody notice this? <laughs> Goes a long way. Um, <laughs> no, it doesn't. Doesn't. You can't just put our logo on something. Um, okay. So next up is Tagged Weddings, Ben and Mindy Peterson.
My name is Ben. My wife Mindy is right over here, and uh, we're wedding photographers here in Grand Rapids. Uh, we built tagged weddings, or in the process of building tagged weddings, because this is something that we want as wedding photographers. I need the clicker. Um, right now, uh, so here's our idea. Brides love to look at pictures. Uh, brides start planning their wedding on Pinterest way before they're even engaged, okay? The process of planning um, their wedding looks a lot like this. They like to love this. They look at pictures. I love this. I want to do this at my wedding. I love this. Here's their pictures. Love this. Love this. Focusing in. What Tagged Weddings wants to do is we want to help brides move from loving this to loving them. If the bride does not know who did the work that's in the images that they love, all of the browsing and clicking and dreaming they do is not helping them know who they might want to hire for their wedding. That's the, that's the gap that we're trying to fill. Um, actually, coming back to this gallery. So this is a wedding gallery my wife and I shot here in Grand Rapids last year. And I would like to introduce you to a few of the vendors who helped put this together. Uh, and on the website, all of these vendors would actually be tagged so the brides would be able to know who they are. First of all, the, the, the wedding was shot at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. Um, flowers, Jen Ederer, are you here? I think you are somewhere right back here. Jen Ederer is from Modern Day Floral and Events. Her team did the flowers planning and design for this beautiful wedding. Um, the dress, which was just an amazing dress. Uh, if you're interested in that, Maggie at Renee Austin in town uh, is able to get that dress for you. Um, and then um, if you like the pictures, uh, if, does anyone love the photography? I do. Okay. All right. Um, that's uh, Studio 623. Uh, my wife's the lead photographer right over there. Um, and I, I took this picture right here. Thank you. All right. That's me. I, I did that one. I get credit for one of those. Um, and then uh, Whitney, um, her hair and makeup was done by Cheeky Strut right here in town. Whitney is a lead stylist at Cheeky, Cheeky Strut. Uh, Whitney might have been here. I don't know if she is, uh, was able to make it or not. Uh, but Whitney is also the beautiful bride in the pictures. Okay? So all of those vendors would be shown in that so the brides could, as they're looking at it, could know where they could get that. So we help brides move from I love this to I love them by showing local weddings that are real weddings, so they're seeing work that can actually be done. And then we tag the, tag the vendors that are shown in the images so the brides know who did the work that they loved. So what's the problem? Why is it hard for brides to discover local talent like, that, that, um, that has their style? We believe it's a problem of the terrible twos. There are many lists that have too many photographers on them, too many vendors on them. One list, if you search for wedding photographers in Grand Rapids, it's going to tell you, show you 500 featured photographers right here in Grand Rapids. Uh, another uh, thing is there are sites that have too many random pictures. If you're trying to find something, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Uh, too much. Some sites cost too much for vendors to be on. So while they show great vendors, it's only showing those vendors that um, can afford or are willing to pay that amount. We want to have a site that shows more of the right vendors. Here's what we did. I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. Basically, we um, building a website in 60 to 90 days. We wanted to build a site. We wanted to fully populate it in West Michigan. We wanted to launch it in two other markets. And then our web developer had to transition in staff and had to stop. We hired a new web developer four weeks ago. Uh, and during that time, we went out and met with as many people as we can. We came up with a list of 74 people we wanted to invite in West Michigan to participate. 40 have already said yes, and our website is not live. By comparison, of these 74, 28 are only listed on The Knot, which is one of the leading brands, and only five are listed on Style Me Pretty. In those four weeks, we only had time to meet with 42 of those 74. 40 people said yes. We believe we've come up with a solution that, that they want, and that's what we're doing. I would love to answer the question of uh, what we're going to do, but you'll have to ask me over a beer because Paul's standing right here. All right, it's all good. Thank you very much. There's a time limit. I mean, you know, it's it, like I stand up, and it's it's kind of how I'm, you know, saying you went over time. I, I I know I come off as a bad guy. It's all right. I get to be get to be the jerk. Um, so we're going to get to fresh milled oats. Scott Bilo, you are next. Thanks. All I can say is I'm glad I uh, got married 20 years ago before any of that existed. Uh, I can't even imagine how you guys go through it now. Uh, but I'm here and I actually probably have the easiest task. We're going to talk about uh, fresh milled oats and essentially it's very simple. I am an oat enthusiast. You can call me the oat guy, but I am an oat enthusiast. 
And the idea is fresher is better, right? It's better for you. I think we can all agree it's better tasting. If you think of a coffee mill, what happens if you apply that to grains, right? Well, we come up with the granary mill. And what we found is that this actually produces a better oatmeal because we're not steaming it like Quaker does or any commercial rolled oat. We're actually milling it fresh in store for the consumer. And it provides a coarser oatmeal, which gives you that mouthfeel and texture that most people want, but you can still cook it quick, unlike your quick cut, uh, your, I'm sorry, steel cut oats. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's in a, a little sweet spot. So we've tested, we were actually hoping to have some results from Whole Foods for you guys, but uh, Whole Foods, we're, we're still chasing our tail a little bit with them, and uh, we can't get them to approve the lease at this point. So what we do have is our Lansing Horrocks mill, and uh, this, the results there have been tremendous. Uh, exceeded our expectations, certainly, as well as Horrocks. We've actually paid the mill off in the first five months. We've sold over $2,000 since uh, Start Garden gave us that uh, $5,000 grant, and actually that cool trailer that's out there on the ground, that's courtesy of Start Garden, so thank you. And uh, it actually helps us move the mills around uh, in this nasty weather here in Michigan. Also, notice that spike? That's sampling. When people sample, they buy because it's really good. So it's, it's, it's key, and that's if there's a future investment, that's one of the things we'll certainly be doing to drive a uh, trial. Uh, the comparison there was Bob's. Everybody heard of Bob's Red Mill Oats? Okay, so we're killing them. That's one single skew. Certainly they've got 30, but even if you took 10 of them, it still wouldn't reach uh, where we've been. Future, we really want to uh, change the overall category. So, you know, if we apply it to oats, why wouldn't you apply it to flour or any other uh, simple grain product that you could do in store? And so this is kind of an artist's drawing of that. So you could do muesli, and who knows, you could even maybe do uh, ready-to-eat cereal, like Rice Krispies or something simple. Thanks. Oh. Uh, free samples in the back corner. Uh, there's two mills. You're welcome to help yourself. You can mill your own or grab a bag. Our uh, two children will be back there helping, assisting, and you're welcome to talk to them as well. Okay. I need a little clicker. Yes. Bring your children. All right. A family friendly joint. Um, route book Stephanie Sundheimer, Jesse Whitmill. Where do you live? There you, oh, hey, right there. I'm Stephanie. This is Jesse, and we're going to talk about Route Book. Route Book's a mobile application that is designed to reduce the stress related to morning commutes. And the way that we do that is by taking all of the factors that influence your commutes, like weather and traffic and parking, and put them in one location inside of the application and link them to an alarm clock so that you have the information you need, when you need it, where you need it. We also implement an activity log and goal tracking so you can see the history of your past commutes and set goals for improving that in the future. So a scenario of how Routebook would be used would be if you want to ride your bike to work in the morning, so you set, you set your alarm to do that, and then you, your alarm goes off and you say, I'm not ready to get out of bed. You could snooze to your next option, which might be to drive. So if you snooze to drive, your activity log would track that, and you could go back and see how much money you spent on parking and gas, and set a goal to improve that spending in the future by not snoozing. There are three groups of people who stand to benefit from what Routebook has to offer. The first group would be advertisers because Routebook knows um, where you are, where you're going, and everywhere you could possibly stop along the way. Uh, the next group that benefits is the community because it really makes public transportation more accessible in a way that it isn't currently. And finally, users can benefit because it really helps them, uh, encouraging them to be the commuter that they want to be and just can't at the time. And Jesse's going to talk about the experiment that we did. OK, so Routebook has a lot of features. But we decided that the most powerful feature is that it has the power to change a user's behavior. So what we did is we took a group of MSU students, and we had them link events in a Google Calendar to regular text-based alerts they receive on their phone through a service called IFT, which means if this, then that. So. Um, so in week one, we simply documented if a user was on time or not. And then in week two, um, we had them, we'd send them three alerts. One was um, like 
you need to leave now, the next one was you should be arriving now, and, oh, and then the first one is you need to wake up, like right now. So if you can go back to week one. Um, so this is one participant, pre-experiment, she was late twice, early twice, and on time, just one time. But then in week two, when she was getting these alerts, um, she was early twice and online three times, or on time three times. So we kind of found this was true across the board, and um, so it, relating back to the bike scenario, it's kind of like this experiment is encouraging you to get up right now, like we're telling you to get up, and it eliminates questions of, oh my god, do I have time to eat? Do I have time to shower? I have to go. So go, go ahead. So in the future, um, right now we have a business plan, we have a prototype, we have um, a functional spec, but we really just need to hire a developer to get this in the Apple iTunes store. Um, and then beyond that, obviously, further marketing and advertising strategies, and then um, continuing user research to ensure a positive user experience for anyone who would use this. If you want, I encourage you to type this URL into your, phone, your um, mobile phone's internet browser, and you can see a clickable version of our prototype. Also, check out our website and follow us on Twitter. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, couple more to go. Benefit, Derek Lally, you are up. So 30 minutes, right? I'm Derek, Shane is another co-founder here. Let me grab the clicker. Benefit was born from the simple question, is it possible to raise funds without fundraising? What does that mean? Well, who in here, a show of hands, has ever been a part of a fundraising campaign before? Let me see your hands. Okay, so you've gone door to door and you've sold $30 tins of popcorn, or you've bought expensive raffle tickets, or uh, you know, um, you've volunteered your time for a cause, or maybe you've strapped on a bikini, washed a few cars, I, I don't know. <laughs> the point is we've all done it, and none of us like it. I don't like fundraising, you don't like fundraising, and I can assure you the schools and the nonprofits, they don't like fundraising. But you know what, they don't have a choice. They're underfunded, they have to do it. Which brings me to my hypothesis. There has to be a better way to raise funds fast. And that's what we've been working on. We've created a benefit, well we call it the benefit mobile application, but with the benefit mobile application, you give while you shop. In other words, you shop at your favorite participating retailers. When you use your mobile device at checkout, a percentage of your transaction immediately goes to the school or the cause of your choice. We call this frictionless fundraising because not a dime has been spent beyond your typical everyday shopping spend. Well, we had to do a few experiments to prove that we could do this. Number one, can we get some retailers? If we don't have retailers uh, that give discounts that we can pass on to the schools and nonprofits, this app is worth nothing. So using Stargarden's initial $5,000 investment, we were able to secure a partner who brings us access to over 70 retailers from day one. So that's really a big deal for us. We're really excited about that. It's gonna take some time. There are one-to-one -one approvals that we have to get, but we're making great headway there. Number two, can we build it? I'm gonna gloss over this one. We've got three founders. All of us have 40, well not, Collect, well, collectively, I should say, not individually. We have 40 plus years of experience designing and developing mobile apps. So we're about 90% of the way done with our uh, iOS app. So we're pretty, pretty confident that we can build this. Number three, will schools and nonprofits want it? This is a big one. Well, when you go to a school and nonprofit and you tell them, we're gonna give you a solution that costs you nothing. We're gonna remove your administrative overhead. We're gonna remove you having to take orders and distribute inventory, they're all ears. We've talked to six or seven, they're all pretty excited about this. We've signed up one exclusively that we're gonna work with over the next three months. We're gonna build them a back-end reporting system where they can track and see their donations. Um, so we're really excited about that as well. Lastly, will everyday consumers use it? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of $30 tins of popcorn. And uh, we know that uh, if we look at global trends right now, mobile payments is a fairly new thing, but companies like Apple and Google and PayPal are all getting into the mobile payment space. We know this is where it's going. And so we're super excited about this. Um, I'm sure uh, we haven't had an opportunity to actually put this in front of customers, which we want to, but we're waiting for the retailer approvals. But we do know by the year 2017, mobile payments will exceed a trillion dollars. So we're pretty excited about this. Lastly, 
uh, our future. We're, as I said, we have an agreement with a, a customer who we're going to be building this back-end reporting and analytics. I've ghosted in the back. We've already started working on it. We're building a public website so that nonprofits and, and schools can actually create profiles and you can select them. You can choose to uh, support those. And we're also building a local iPad app so we can pull in local retailers as well. So we appreciate everything Star Garden uh, has done for us and we appreciate you guys all being here tonight. Thank you very much. All right. I got hit up by one of those kids selling popcorn yeah. just last night. <laughs> um, the Sherpa, Pat Shields, you're up. Hello, everyone. Good evening. So um, I'm Pat Shields, and I'm here with the Sherpa from my nice fancy logo. Um, if you can't tell, it's about bikes. Um, as much as I like to stand up here and kind of convert everyone to being an avid cyclist like myself, uh, this product is really more towards uh, geared towards the guy who bikes already and really um, managing that experience and making it easier overall for him or her, I should say. Um, so there's a gap in the biking industry, and this is a very well description of what it is. Even though it's a little comical, it's pretty accurate. There's high performance cyclists, and then there's adolescent cyclists. And this gap is really because of the maintenance fees that come along with it. So let's say you buy a $2,000 bike, you know, a $20 to a $200 maintenance fee isn't going to be that much. If you're a kid, you're probably going to ride your bike till you know, it rusts through the frame and your wheels fall off. Um, and then the middle is really the average cyclist who's left, you know, kind of like the commuter, the day to work, goes on the weekend. Um, they buy a bike usually. And what they find in the end is that there's these, all these little maintenance fees, the hassles of carrying your bike to the shop, picking it up. Um, and the research that I've done, along with IDEO, did um, a big program in the, in the early 2000s with Trek and Shimano, um, really studying that it was the maintenance um, part of it that really caused a lot of um, separation from the bike. So people would get a flat tire. They don't want to schedule a big, um, you know, going, picking up, dropping off your bike. Sits in the shed for a while. You know, spring cleaning comes around, still sits in the shed, and you're kind of done with it after, um, after then. So the Sherpa is a multi-tool for changing a flat tire. If it's kind of like, um, like a Swiss Army knife for um, specifically a flat tire. So what this does is it tries to fill the gap in the biking industry, specifically the tools to maintain and sustain the habit. Um, and right here you can see on the left is the average uh, bike kit and really the solution for it right now. It's five to six individual tools, um, usually plastic. They're not that durable. They're easy to lose. And what the, what the Sherpa does is it combines it all into one. So you have a metal body, very durable, long-lasting. And then you have an insulative strap, which holds a sleeve for the patches. And then what that does is it holds the canister as well. And during this, it really focuses on ergonomics, um, trying to find the harmony and the balance between all these objects. And then the goal is to create an easy to carry, easy to um, kind of introduce in your life and your whole lifestyle into biking. And kind of, again, make the um, experience a little more easy and natural. So my target market is um, current riders, future riders, children, adults, mountain bikers, commuters, and road bikers. So this is kind of like the entire spectrum of the bike industry. But in each one of these groups is a niche market of the people that want to get more hands on, the people that actually are interested in it and want to have the kind of self, the self gratification of knowing they did it themselves. Um, they're, not get, get it, they're not afraid to get their hands a little dirty. Um, it's kind of like, this is for more like Joe the Plumber and not like Lance Armstrong, so more casual version of that. Um, so what I've done so far is created my LLC, uh, Shidoti. Um, research ergonomics, kind of finding out what worked and didn't work for other industries. Um, usually there's this pattern of, you. Uh, combine everything to a simpler design and usually it ends up more of a hassle and kind of um, a cluttered object for the user and in an end you know they don't use it at all and then researching demographics really kind of what's different between say changing a flat tire in Southern California or Northern Maine um, and after that did prototyping worked with Disher Design and Tiger Studios for a little bit to get a better idea of where it go, what will go and progress. And then my future plans are for engineering and manufacturing to set a price point and so on. Um, and then eventually get into stores, users, and kind of um, get the support of everyone. And um, so this project is pretty early on. Um, it has a lot of growth to it still. 
Um, and this won't be the last time you guys see the shirt, but hopefully. Thanks. Oh. And you're done. You can say do, it to me and then I'll tell them. He does have a prototype. If anyone wants to see it afterward. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you know, who, who's working on a project in the room? Just a quick show of hands. You got sort of something you're tinkering around with in the back of your mind. Is anybody considering the minivan lifestyle? Because I'm looking for innovations in that category. Um, okay, very final presentation of the evening. Gaspar Gallery, Chris Cox, Ben Biondo, Jacob Bullard. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Well, hello, hi, and good evening to everybody. I appreciate you all coming out. My name is Ben Biondo. This is Christopher Cox and Jacob Bullard, and collectively, we make up Gaspar. So what is Gaspar, you may ask yourself in a moment of weakness. Well, it is a, a contemporary art gallery located in downtown Grand Rapids, just off Division Avenue. So upon recently moving to Grand Rapids, we all uh, kind of realized there is a respect for and a desire to stimulate an already growing art community. Art Prize and such has proven that. But we also realized that in order for Grand Rapids to contain a vibrant art culture, there needs to be a stage for working contemporary artists to exhibit and sell their work. So we decided to open the gallery. Thank you, Ben. Really interesting. Gaspar is distinctly contemporary, yet entirely commercial. The environment of Gaspar, as you can see here, has been created to fil facilitate the interaction with conceptual artworks. The gallery space encourages focused attention to artworks and exists for more than merely decorative entertainment. Our exhibitions are both highly curated and have distinct opening and closing dates. And despite the formal presentation of the works in the gallery, we are not a museum and everything in the gallery is indeed for sale. Currently, we're in the middle of our third exhibition. Other than just high attendance, all of our exhibitions have been highly successful as far as sales. We have sold more than $1,300 in our first two exhibitions, and our third is projected to likely sell similarly upon its closing in just a few short weeks. We have received encouraging press locally from the Grand Rapids Magazine, Review, and the Rapidian. Additionally, we have created a distinct brand and experience as seen by the posters here. Our brand represents that experience, and those who attend our exhibitions have known to appreciate and trust that brand. Thank you, Chris, it's very enlightening. Um, since opening our doors, uh, we've certainly been encouraged, um, but we've, we've also really learned a lot about ourselves as well as the, br as well as the brand. We have found that um, the demands of operating the gallery at our current model, which is an exhibition a month, really requires us to interact with it primarily as business owners and event promoters. But then we also realize that our strengths and the strengths of the brand that we created really lie in not just us cultivating art, but through actively creating it. So we want to be positioning ourselves um, to be operating the gallery as a greater extension of our own creative activity. For this reason, um, we are shifting our model of operation. Our last monthly exhibition is going to be in April. Um, and we have decided to have four exhibitions a year. Each of those is going to coincide with a journal that we will publish. Uh, the first exhibition and journal will be uh, released in September 2013. Great idea, Jacob. What will this shift do for us? It will allow us to do several things. Firstly, it will allow us to diversify our product range while generating additional profits. We will be able to expand our reach outside of Grand Rapids while remaining rooted in the storefront on Division Avenue. Most importantly, we will utilize our individual strengths. There will be more time for curation, creating, development, and collection of artworks. There will be considerable less focus on event promotion, shifting our audience's focus, focus on actually engaging with the artworks rather than merely attending a social event. Thank you, everyone. Here's Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. It's very enlightening. Um, uh, all right, so that is it. Uh, again, tweet any comments, questions to uh, these teams. You can use the hashtag StarGarden or their Twitter handles that, uh, that were up there. And now we play music and we have a drink, and in about 20 minutes we'll come back and StarGarden team will give feedback. Thank you.
Rooms are located behind me, in case you're wondering.
stars go off I saw them stars go off at night Thumbs and bleed 
till it burns, till it melts away. So I'm looking in on the good life I might be. Do you never define without a trust or flaming? We're gonna bring it back in. Such a futile endeavor. We are going to start in a few short minutes. We're gonna get started. That's how they do it at the opera, by the way. <laughs> rowdy crowd, rowdy crowd. Where's Joe Lampin? Ah, there you are, okay. All right, this is it, we're gonna get started. I'm not even kidding this time. Um, uh, okay, so I'm going to take him up, go, go ahead and make your way back to a seat. Yeah. We're gonna get started in 30 seconds. Microphones. Two trim tables on microphones. We're all set. Let's go. Okay, okay. Good catch. All right. First time we got this, right? All right. First time, first time. Raise your hand if you can hear me. Raise your hand if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah? Can you hear me in the back? Check. Anyone Check. Sitting in the back and raise your hand. Yes? Good? Okay. Um, so let me introduce to you the Start Garden panel that will be giving feedback. I'm lost. Uh, let me introduce the people who will be giving the feedback to our teams tonight. Um, that, anybody hear that whistling? Yeah. It, yeah. Thank you, Paige. Somebody's going to walk out from behind here in like 10 seconds and be like, you were using the sink, weren't you? Um, so Rick DeVos, who is our uh, CEO and founder, is not able to be here tonight. Uh, I am sorry. He's a highly attractive individual. He's great to look at. He's not able to sit up here tonight. I'm sorry. Um, but we have four really attractive individuals uh, here instead. So this is Mike Morin. Mike Morin is in charge of uh, portfolio relations. And he's got an, quite a bit of experience in putting together deals for startups and examining startups. And he's an investor deal maker kind of guy. Next to him is Kim Pasquino, uh, formerly known as Kim Clapp, as her badge will um, show you. She is recently uh, married. And yes, give it up. Yes. 
exciting. Kim is also uh, works with Mike in portfolio relations, uh, doing a lot of the same stuff Mike does, the, but she is really that central connecting point for a lot of these teams and that broader ecosystem that I mentioned earlier. So she's uh, obvious one, one of the like, first contact points for these teams and, and sticks with them throughout the months. Uh, next to her is Benjamin Gott. Ben Benjamin Gott is our entrepreneur in residence. Um, have any of you had a uh, boxed water beverage? Yes. That is, that is Ben's company. Yeah. Uh, he's got a, a bunch of other projects and, and different things in the, in the works, but that is uh, probably what he's best known for. And, and we, we like having him here because he's basically maybe two, three years in front of where some of these teams are tonight. And lastly, we have our financial controller, Joe Lampin. And I, I introduced Joe um, before. When a financial controller um, can sometimes be a, um, a, a frightening thing to bring aboard, uh, something as weird as Star Garden. But uh, Joe, one of our requirements was that this person had startup experience. And Joe has actually uh, attempted to create his own startup and learned lessons that many of us have learned along the way. Cutting checks um, and breaking necks, you know? A real <laughs> controller. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you go from there, Paul? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I wonder if you're going to rap later. Okay. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to do something a little bit unusual tonight. Uh, because this is something that comes up at every single one of these events. There's like a point of confusion uh, that, that we often run into here at Start Garden um, that has to do with the fact that an entrepreneur technically is somebody who is starting their own business. Yes? yes. Do we all kind of agree to that? Uh, however, when it comes to uh, what are things that are investable, like Star Garden's a venture capital fund, so we're looking for things that are investable. And we start to get into all these nuanced conversations of like what's investable, what's not investable. I, I found an article, thanks to Laura Vaughn, if you're in the room, thank you. Uh, it was written a while back by uh, Mr. Steve Blank. It's called Why Governments Don't Get Startups. Um, Although that's the topic of the article, that's not what we're going to run through tonight. Uh, because in the article, he actually breaks down different types of startups. And I'm hoping that this provides a bit of clarity here tonight. Uh, if it doesn't, it's only a couple minutes of your time. OK. Uh, so first off, we have the lifestyle startup. Uh, he calls this the work to live their passion. This is, I mean, a, probably an example would be um, somebody like a, a guitar player who loves playing guitar, has bands, and they start teaching guitar lessons because it's a flexible way that they can make money doing what they like to do. Um, oftentimes we run into uh, the lifestyle startup when we're here at uh, Start Garden. It's not really built to grow much bigger than the owner of the business. Then there is the small business startup. Uh, this actually accounts for over 95% of all new businesses in the country every year. Small business is probably exactly what you think. It's like an independent grocery store. It can be a consultant. It can be a small design agency. But the, the purpose is that it, own, it provides a living for the owner and the various employees that it, the small business employs. And then you have the scalable startup. This one is actually, uh, this is a business that's actually intentionally designed to become something much bigger, to grow exponentially. Uh, in which case, so you know, they start to deal with different types of problems, like how can I go from making 1,000 of these a month to 100,000 of these a month, and you know, reduce my costs and increase my margins. Uh, and the big difference between the born to be big scalable startup is that it's, the difference between the small business is, small business is about earning a living, scalable startup is about building equity. Um, so that investors can buy 10%, and that 10% that they bought for, say, $100,000 grows into something that's worth a million dollars later. Um, and then there's the buyable startup. This is kind of a, a recent thing. It's the born to flip startup. Uh, Instagram would be a great example of this. It didn't necessarily have a business model that made it very attractive to Facebook. What made it attractive to Facebook was that they were just eating up all of their um, photo sharing activity on Facebook. Instagram's an app that sold for a billion dollars to Facebook this last year. Uh, but again, it wasn't, it wasn't because they had an enormous amount of revenue, but it was because they were you know, uh, eating up something that Facebook found core to their business. And then lastly, we have the social startup, a startup that is driven to make a distance, difference. This is like quite popular, actually, these days. It's a lot of ideas that um, are focusing on making an impact over making a profit. Uh, and then the tricky thing with the social startup is that actually a social startup is just an emphasis, a primary emphasis on a social impact versus 
profit building, but in its structure, a social startup really is a lifestyle startup or a small business startup or a scalable startup or a viable startup. So it gets hard to categorize a social startup beyond the fact that it uh, exists to make a social impact. So does that bring any clarity, new thinking, as far as helping, helping you understand how we sometimes look at startups when you're saying, you know, you're funding new businesses, what are you looking for? Anything? Nobody's even nodding. Like, honestly, people. Okay, I'll never, ever, ever, ever do this again. <laughs> okay, so let's get to it. I know, I am sweating. Look, I sweat when I get nervous. Um, yeah, it is, it, I, I think it helps, it helps people understand sort of, you know, the nuances. Hey, Paul, I think it's helped. <clears throat> you don't hear me talk from up here much, oh. so. <laughs> <clears throat> I think it is helpful to point out that the things that we've, you know, traditionally been looking for as a venture capital fund are either that scalable or viable. Yeah. So I don't know if you pointed that out, but I, I think that's that's one of the differences that that we look for. Oh, when but we're it, there, and there is something, and this is something we often say we, at that five thousand dollar level. We're totally okay with the idea that something might be lifestyle, it might be a small business, because the $5,000, when it's a new idea, you kind of don't know where it's going to go. They may discover, and we have seen several teams discover new opportunities that suddenly leapfrog from a lifestyle business into a scalable business over the course of a couple months. Uh, yeah, so if somebody would have come up to you and said, I'm going to launch this iPhone app, and I'm going to let people like take all these pictures and share them, and put them out there, and I'm not going to charge them anything, and it's going to take astronomical amounts of bandwidth, how many of you would have said, hey, I'm in? Right? I mean, so, so the, you know, the point being, even though the, all those things Steve Blank says is true, it's very, very hard at the front end to know which are which. Right? Sometimes we do. We make, you know, we make, uh, you know, our judgments about what's what. But it's not always that easy to tell at the beginning. And, and that's kind of Stark Garden's philosophy. We don't always know where the next big thing is coming from. So even though everything Steve Blank says is true, at the same time, you know, don't be sitting here going, oh, my God, I don't, you know, I don't know if, I'm, if my idea is big enough. Because, you know, we often don't know. Yeah, it's true. This early is too hard to tell. Okay, so we're now we're going to get started with doing some uh, feedback. And the first up, hey, oh, that's the name of the article again, in case you're looking for it. Uh, Gaspar. All right. Who's, hey, guys. Who's on this one? I, it's me. It's Ben. Um, I know you guys personally, which is interesting. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. Thanks for presenting. Um, something I've always found super interesting in uh, two of the most creative industries, which is fashion and uh, art, art, let's just call it fashion and art, is that they never innovate. Um, if anybody's been to a fashion website, it's almost entirely flash still. Welcome to like seven years ago. Um, I really find that interesting though, why the most creative industries don't innovate that much. Um, and, with, and with innovation, I mean exponential improvement. We talk about that a lot. Are you an incremental improvement or are you an exponential improvement to a pre-existing industry? Um, I love it though, because the door is wide open for like super crazy innovation to happen. On the web right now, you're in a tough spot. Uh, there's not a lot of space for innovation left, but in art and fashion, there's a ton. Kind of those, um, what I call them, irrational industries. Um, Gaspard is a brilliant art gallery. In fact, as you guys know, and I need to pick some of them up, uh, I, per I personally purchased a ton of work at your guys' space. Um, highly recommend visiting it. If you haven't, it's up to Vision, like they mentioned. The next show, I think, is with Jeff Krause, a uh, favorite artist of mine. Um, but as a gallery, I think, uh, you know, what's interesting about it, um, it's not an exponential improvement in how galleries work in general. Uh, new business is powered by experiments that attempt the impossible or to change the entire way something's done completely changing the whole way galleries thought about maybe or something like that. Um, and in my personal opinion, during your experiment and kind of the team's opinion, there wasn't that, my goodness, this is going to change how art galleries work forever. It's going to completely change how things are. And uh, so with that, I'm a massive fan of your gallery, but moving forward at a $20,000 investment is a no for us. All right. Please give it up for Gaspar Gallery. <laughs> Ben, Ben, are you an art collector? <laughs> On a very small scale, yeah. yeah. I've tried to participate in the past. I've lived downtown for about 10 or 11 years, and I've tried to participate. I think it's an extremely important thing in, in downtown. Of any downtown, downtown's more of an idea instead of an actual space. And I think it's important to support the arts, um, not just by grants, not by government grants, but by people actually collecting. And um, that's the difference between a lifestyle business and a scalable business. In fact, hopefully, and this not, not everybody might agree with me here, but if, if art galleries stay as lifestyle businesses, hopefully the art is better. If we create really scalable, big, massive art galleries, uh, I'm concerned that the art actually might suffer from that. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Shh. Okay, people back there, I hear you. Um, up next is Cunable. Cunable, all right, John. 
So John has a huge amount of credibility in the publishing space, um, lots of relational equity and knowledge, and has the ability to actually pick up the phone and make some connections on his own, which has gone a long way in, uh, in working towards proving out this hypothesis. So it turns out, it does appear, that authors can maybe cash in on their fan base, and Cunable could potentially um, make some money from that too. And in the 60 and 90 days, John was really able to um, get a yes from a huge, uh, his huge customer, which was a publisher, and this publisher wanted a contract and this potential to possibly invest and also connect them to some uh, authors that would go a long way also in proving out the hypothesis. So really the next step for John is he needs some funding to go to that next step to create this platform. So with that, we would like to invest 20000 to get him to that next place. <laughs> Okay. Um, I, I, sometimes I ask questions and I sort of, you know, uh, I, if I feel like they're not explaining something very well, but I felt like Cunable was kind of, uh, that one was fairly straightforward. Uh, so we're going to move on to the next one, which is Tagged Weddings. That's me too. Okay. So Tagged Weddings. So everybody here knows what um, Pinterest is, but we kind of thought this twist on where, there they are. We sort of thought this twist on the whole local wedding market was interesting. And um, we know you got derailed with the whole development of the website, which was a bit of a bummer. But um, actually through that, you, you showed a ton of, trans of resiliency. And you made a comment um, the other day that it was really the best thing that happened to you because it got you in front of your customer base. So that part was pretty cool. And, and you got a lot of positive feedback. So, I mean, this is a situation really where the experiment's just not complete. Um, I think you guys know that, you know, you've gotten so far, but we really need it to, um, people to make those connections. So with that, it's, um, it's a not now for us, because we think in the next 90 days, we'll, it'll be very telling, and, uh, and we'll both know. So we'll track with you, and we're pretty excited about how that turns out. All right, so I'm gonna ask a quick, quick question. Uh, by the way, there's a not now category. For those of you who don't know, there's now, yes, right? there's no, there's not now. Not now usually indicates that there's something interesting in the experiment, the experiment's not done yet. Uh, but I'm wondering if you guys could chat a little bit, maybe a little more specifically for those that are following Tagged Weddings, like what would be the next thing they would do if they're not now? Well, so they, they went out and talked to those 42 vendors, videographers, photographers, right? And they all said, yeah, we love it when it's up and running, right? But they only just got that going. So they're making some finer tweaks in order to let that out in the wild. So the real test is that do those 40 people actually come up and pay the money, right? And you know, once they, and, but the, the interesting thing about these guys is that because of who they are in that industry, they're really making connections with the best, um, you know, the best folks in that, in that world for brides. So, I mean, that's really it. We have to see if people yeah, sign and up. and it's, it's a marketplace, you know? You've got a bunch of people that you need tagging and saying they like, I love, by the way, I love your phrase, uh, I like this, but I love them. Yeah. And that's taking the web and turning it into something physical, something that someone can actually make a decision on instead of just randomly liking stuff all the time. Actually putting some real currency instead of social currency behind it. So you've got to figure out those people, you've got to make them fall in love and use it a bunch, and then you've got to make the photographers and the spaces and the people that have the assets in the wedding space kind of fall in love. And I have a, a couple friends that are getting married this summer, and I. I'm young, so I didn't know Zach. I will right standing right next to him, and um, and I. But but it's insane. Sorry, the amount of energy people put into this stuff, and it's a massive market, and somebody's going to win in it, right? right? And not that it jays my perspective, but anybody here know the phrase West Michigan nice, right? So when they go out to 42 people and they say, "Hey, we're going to do this. You want to use it?" And everybody's, "Yeah, yeah, we'll use it." <laughs> What else is anybody saying in West Michigan, right? So, you, you know, so, uh, just, but, you know, we'll, I think they will. But I just think it's, you know, in West Michigan, we've got to wait and see, right? Because everybody's going to say, yeah, and we'll, let's, let's see if they actually post their stuff. Yes, yes. Great. Mike Morin, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes. So, yes, clap for uh, tag weddings. Thank you. All right, so next up uh, is the Sherpa. Uh, Sherpa. Can change the slide. Right. It looks like that. Patrick, um, really love the your ability to use all the resources that uh, you get. You came in the space even before you had submitted and and started using the advisors and 
we're really able to use the network uh, to your advantage to build your build out your prototype. Um, and I really think that what you're working on is a uh, pretty cool project. But because it took so long to kind of build the prototype, we didn't really get any real world feedback on whether or not your end customer would end up um, wanting a product like this. So for us, without any feedback like that, it's a no. But uh, one thing to think about is it might be a, um, a good Kickstarter project to take a look at as well. But also keep us posted on you know, where you're going with it. OK, so I have an immediate question come to mind. Either we'll have it in a moment. Um, uh, so but it sounds like the Sherpa's not done with an experiment, and Tag Weddings is not done with an experiment. One's a not now, one's a no. What's the, what's the difference in your mind between these two? Um, you, you know, it, we look at Tag Weddings, and, and they've, they kind of got derailed by this website not being done. And, and they're so close to actually getting that feedback. And so within the next 90 days, to me, I, I think we're going to have a good feel for what that's like. We don't necessarily have what that time frame is for the Sherpa. I guess in my mind is one little differentiator. Um, you know, the, the tagged weddings is, is taking a, a, a new approach uh, and, and kind of segueing into something that doesn't exist. It's, it's t t kind of tying a couple of different pieces together and doing something different and, and providing a different type of service and exploring a, a new world. You know, like I mentioned, the, you know, there's the, the bike components and supplies market is very crowded. There's a lot of different stuff. And I think that there's um, it, an immense amount of um, competition in that space as well. So uh, you know, the feedback that, that he's going to get on that is, is going to be extremely important that we need, right. need to I think, see. I think Tag Weddings has some customers on deck. And you have just a little bit more work before you can get some customers with this thing actually in their hand where they paid for it. And it's just a, it's just a timing thing. And I think Tag Weddings, to me personally, is a huge acquisition target. And, and give me some grace here for using extreme examples to kind of kind of portray it. But there, you know, there's there, there's a, a phrase in the industry that it, that in terms of that, you know, entrepreneurs are obsessed with solving a problem or with the market, and that at times, you know, engineers and inventors are obsessed with an idea or creating a product. And that's not exactly the case in this notion. But I think you know the difference is where we're like, you, you know, the, the, the obsessive focus when you're an entrepreneur has got to be on as quickly as possible figuring out whether the market is interested in what you're doing. It's like, like Paul said kind of the beginning, you're sending a message out there and you're trying, you know, it's like sonar, you're trying to get something back from the market. And so like in, the, in, in these cases, when, when there's a lot done on the product side, but we can't hear anything back from the market, it's really, really hard for us um, you know, e e even if you can make it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the market wants it. And so from a return on investment perspective, you know, we're always, we recognize that there's a difference in, in different products and different offerings in terms of what you need in order to be able to get that feedback from the market. But I really think it's important that the entrepreneur's obsession is customers. Is customers. Is customers and what the customer thinks, not necessarily can I make it, can I build it, can I design it. That kind of stuff, and so I, I think there's in these two there's there's a there's a balance difference in terms of the data that came back during the experiment. All right, all right. Thank you to the Sherpa. <laughs> oh, we have uh, this is benefit. This is benefit slide, by the way. You in the back? I can still hear you. Shh. <laughs> it's like a it's a blizzard. OK, go ahead. Uh, you're done now? <laughs> OK, good. Thank you. Thank you for that weather alert. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, benefit. One of, you know, one of the things that, that I, I don't know that Derek went into in depth is, you know, I don't know how many of you have ever participated in script programs or things of that nature related to schools and whatever. It's so, one of those things that doesn't exist until yeah, you like have your first child. Yeah, like so like, one of the dangers I was talking about this is until you're like 30 something years old and you have kids and you're trying to figure out how you're going to pay Christian school tuition or something like that, you don't necessarily encounter a lot of these programs. But this is a this is a a multi multi million dollar industry that already exists. Um. So so the reality is benefit is bringing technology to bear on an industry that already exists. You know the challenge that exists whenever you're doing that is you're trying to you're trying to um, motivate to some degree a level of behavior change, right? In terms of the consumers, right now they're using physical cards. You got to get them to move to mobile devices and something a little bit different. And in terms of the people that are offering, um, the, you, you know, these promotions, in some cases they're 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 not caught up in terms of technology and they're not quite ready for this yet. But you look at where the trend line's going, and you're kind of betting on where things are going, not necessarily where things are. Um, you know, 
having a customer is a significant deal. When you've got a beta customer um, on base that's ready, not, not only one that's going to try something, but that's actually going to generate revenue in the process of doing that, you know, that's a, that's a big deal. You're referring um, to the, the school? Yeah, the school. Again, you're, you know, good clarification, Paul. I mean, when you really look at this, the customers is schools and nonprofits. The customer is not really end users that are going to redeem these coupons. They come as a byproduct of the enterprises. Um, the team that's involved in this has a lot of background in this industry um, and has a lot of background in what it takes to create software. Uh, and you really have the uh, capacity to, to execute this, you know, with, within what you've got. Um, I, you know, you guys probably aren't surprised, but, uh, you know, our answer is, yeah, we're interested in doing some further investment. We have to, we have to figure out what that looks like because we don't totally know what's needed to get to the next step. Um, but we're interested in further investment and benefit. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I, I just out of point of curiosity, you sort of alluded to like a good team behind it, but of course we just saw Derek tonight. I mean, is there like, a, a, I don't know, tips, tips on like <laughs> building? I'm sure this guy's good. You're, you're a team of one. Um, but like, are there, are there like general elements to a good team? I mean, do you guys have things that you know, if it's for? a tech company, the, the one thing that I personally like the most is if you have a tech co-founder on staff. Uh, as a partner in the company with some equity or something like that. We've had submissions who come in that I think are great ideas, but um, it's extremely expensive to develop a web app and even more expensive to develop an iOS app and things like that. Right. And it's even more expensive to get design resource on something. So if you can do that internally in your own team, you're, you're, you're cutting around everything else. You're cutting around the margins that everybody else needs to make to get that kind of scrappy startup thing going. And uh, you guys have a team, and like you said, 40 plus years combined experience and making stuff like that happen. That's an, un we like to call that an unfair advantage to someone who's just coming into the market with nothing. I, I think Ben hit it. Unfair advantage is the word. That's what I'm looking for. Whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, John, you've got relationships, ties, you've got ins into the market, you've got the ability to make things happen that the average person can't make happen, or you've got some capacity, some expertise that others don't have. That's obviously, you know, gives, gives you a leg up. I mean, there's a lot of businesses, you know, like how many people here have come up with an idea that's like, hey, this is something that someone else should do. You know, this is, boy, this, wouldn't it be great if, you know, Home Depot did this or someone did that. Those are great ideas and they're really interesting, but you really don't have any advantage in executing that. And if you don't, you're really, you know, you're really, you know, have an uphill battle ahead of you. So if you don't have an advantage, you're at a disadvantage. So, yeah. Yeah. matter of fact, yes, exactly. I'm trying to be nice, but yes, you're right. You're not. You're, you're and wrong. I would just chime in and say, I think also a strong team knows when their team isn't enough. So, like when John got up, he has, like we said, ton of knowledge, um, connections into that space, and got up right away and said, I need a tech co-founder. So it's identifying that there's an element that you have that is missing, and you're willing to bring that on in some position with a company. All right. All right. Yeah, no, that, thank you. Thank you very much. That's more than I expected. Um, fresh milled oats. I do, you guys are so brilliant. Yes, over there. <laughs> Has everybody gotten their oatmeal? And do you intend to get your oatmeal before you leave? Yeah, please do okay. that. That was going to be what I was saying. Take, take all of it. Um, this super interesting company, I remember when you came in and showed us your stuff. One of my, you mentioned it a little bit in your presentation, but we've talked about it. There's a shift from Consumers like uh, prepackaged goods were super interesting. Everybody wanted a prepackaged good, and now everything's kind of shifting over to the well, how fresh is it? Uh, where, where did it come from? Why is there so much packaging? Um, I think that packaging hasn't changed much in the past 30 to 20 years. That might be a little excessive. But I actually think in the physical product space, it's going to be one of the more emerging markets, one of the more innovative things. Not necessarily changing package, but changing how you actually get the product. In his case, it's um, milled right on spot. So Fresh Mill also is interesting because it's almost two businesses in one, it's, it, and they augment each other. It's a packaged good. It's a, it's a milled oat that you can, and, and people are taking it home. But it's also this machine that's a bit of an experience as well. You can actually mill them on site. You can understand how it works. I remember seeing it for the first time myself. It's super interesting. Um, and you've had success in the independent stores. Uh, like Horrocks, I mean, the, the graph you put up is really interesting, and we've been going back and forth a little bit on on that. If you kind of saw the massive growth or the massive, I think you guys have made something like two grand in, the, in this in the period of Starcard and the other competitor 
the pre-existing competitor that does something like $15 million a year, Bob's, did only about 200 bucks. So what we're trying to figure out is, are you, are you cannibalizing that market, uh, or their share, or something like that, or are you adding to the market? And that's kind of a whole other thing. But you're having a hard time, and, and I know this from, from Boxed Water, in getting into the huge big boxes. Or not even big box, but big chains, whole, you know, Whole Foods, Global, or, or yeah, Global, and, and then you know, the, the bigger chains and things like that. So from that standpoint, um, feasibility and desirability I don't think have been completely proven out yet. Um, you have some inventory of machines left over, you have some placement, we were talking earlier about this, where those things are going to go. This one's a not now for me uh, by a string because I think you're going to know a lot in the next 60 to 90 days because you have machines actually made and ready to rock. Um, your numbers have been fantastic. We just need to track and learn a little bit more about what you're going to do. I, I love consumer packaged goods, so I think there's a cool future for this. And when you start eating into the margin and the, and the sales of the big guys, things get really interesting. And I think that's where you're heading in that direction. I, okay, quick question. Because um, it sounds like... Sounds. Sounds <laughs> like... Um, like the not now was get into a big box retailer. No, I'm sorry. I should have clarified that. Um, so... Can I, I'm going to quick story, if I'm allowed to. Yeah, you uh, so when we started Box Water, uh, well, one, I didn't know anything of what I was doing. Um, really, we didn't. And I think that's actually an advantage when you're starting a, a company that's in a space of, of giants. Um, but we, we decided that it was way too hard, and maybe we didn't have a nice enough suit to go present to Meyer or to Whole Foods or to DNW. So instead, we sold all the stores that we went to on a daily basis. Uh, Grand Central Market, which is still one of our best-selling stores right around the corner. And we did that, and we repeated that model again and again in Michigan, then we went to Chicago, then we went to L.A. and New York and all that. And while it wasn't the most profitable way to grow our company, it was the easiest way to get to the customer. Because I believe there's, there's kind of three people. You've got distributors, you've got retailers who sell stuff, and then you've got the customer. Customer is the most important no matter what. Nobody else exists unless the customer says, I really like what you've got there. So uh, I think you guys should chase the chains and stuff like that because they're going to give you that large volume. But don't forget, and I don't think you have the small guys, even a Grand Central Market or whoever that might be, because the customers ultimately are the bosses of everyone. When we say the market, everybody reports to the customers. No one really works for themselves. You work for your customers. So I think that's kind of what I would say is find the way to get to your customers the fastest you can. All right. Thank you to the Fresh Milled Oats. Route book. So, so route book. Um, so, yeah. Um, here's here's one of the interesting things. So, one of your one of your hypotheses here, and your main one was that you're going to help users become uh, the commuters that they want to be. Paul, can I have a little license here for a little bit of a rant? Okay. So, I know I know I make him cringe every time I do this. So, I, I think this is a great example to talk about the notion of behavior change. Right? And, and, and in their presentation, they talked about that, about that the application has the power to change the behavior of, of, you know, of people. One of the things that we're always looking at is, you know, I know we've got some other people that are investors in the room, some of the grand angels and different people. Um, behavior change is a huge, huge issue. Um, when, when you're pursuing an application that requires behavior change, it's, it's, you know, it's a task, right? I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to ask in here who married somebody thinking that they were going to change their behavior and how that, how that experiment went. But, uh, but, you know, I'm just saying, it's, it's not an easy thing. Uh, so, you know, I thought that was inter an, an interesting thing. And you're talking about changing the, be you know, the behavior of people. Um, you know, the ultimate solution here is a combination of external data sources with kind of existing applications like calendars. So, you know, you've got traffic data, weather data. Um, you know, the technology in this space is converging fairly rapidly. Um, all of those kind of functions are taking on a lot of new stuff. So I think, you know, the question here for us is, you know, regarding one, does this information that's being provided have the ability to literally change the behavior of a person? And two, you know, when we're looking at these, there's a couple different things that this could be. Uh, you know, is this a business or is it a feature that exists Within and secondly, is this a is this kind of a a radical new deviation or is this really just an iteration 
of something that maybe exists today. Um, you know, I think you can probably tell where I'm, where I'm going from some of my conversation, but you know, when we look at this, our belief is that this is more of a, a feature or an iteration that, that favors an incumbent in the market. And I, and I also, you know, I, th I think I would say I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that, um, you know, the person that can't get up on time for class or can't do stuff, that necessarily another piece of information is what's going to solve that dilemma and cause behavior change. Maybe it will. You know, maybe I'm wrong. I still think that, you know, the problem they're trying to solve in this issue around commuting and everything that's involved in commuting and the dilemmas around commuting is a super, super interesting space. You know, with new urbanization and different stuff happening, I, I think it's an interesting space. But I, I'm, I'm not sure that this particular solution, you know, really, really hits on it. Um, so, you know, for that reason, uh, you know, our, our notion is that we're, we're not going to invest further in this, but it, it's always good to have Spartans in the room as a fellow Spartan. So, so go green, if nothing else. Thanks, guys. So, yeah. I know, Paul. I, I've given you tons of fodder there. I know. I know. I mean, you've used this phrase, uh, it favors an incumbent in this space. I just wonder if you could actually ex unpack that. Yeah, so are any of you big favors of, like, you know, disruptive change stuff and Clayton Christensen and anybody ever read any of that stuff and look at matrices and whatever? So there, there's this notion that, that when you're pursuing something that's disruptive, um, it, that, that things that are truly disruptive, you know, generally go after a customer base that incumbents, people currently in the business don't care about or aren't using, and probably has a business model that would be very difficult for them to migrate to, if, even if they did become attracted to it. And things, things that are like that, that are truly disruptive, tend to favor new entrants, because it's very, very hard for existing business to go there. But things that, that really are going after current customer bases, and, and, can, and can fairly easily fit into the business model of people that are currently in the market, those tend to favor people that are already in that business. Now, every now and then, somebody gets enough traction that it's worth it for one of those big companies to buy them. But it, it's, it's really infrequent. So Who's in the space that Rootbook is, Routebook well, is playing in? Sorry. Yeah, I, I think there's, I mean, frankly, I think there's a lot of people in that space. It's, it's, it's everything from calendaring apps. I mean, I, you know, maybe somebody else from the team can weigh in on this, but. There was a recent article, thanks Joe. There was a recent article that Android's kind of playing in this space too, where they're taking their Google, Google Apps uh, with a calendar, the mapping, and calendar systems and doing some of this. Again, it doesn't mean that it's not a business, it doesn't mean that it's not interesting, it's just, it's, it's just something that uh, we think is a bit more of a feature than a business. All right, all right. Again, thank you. thanks again to Routebook. <laughs> is our, our final, our final uh, presentation or no project of the evening no. testing hey. Hey. wow Amanda Chaco. Amanda Chaco everybody <laughs> but but thanks for handing me the dead one I'm not sure what I was gonna do with it no problem <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so um, so trying to test a summer sport you know, you know warm weather product in Michigan in the middle of winter uh, kind of poses a problem um, and and so you know what what we kind of thought was your solution to it by you know traveling down to Flo you know getting a, fl a plane ticket flying down to Florida going to a water sports park and putting it in the hands of some users and by it I mean like an early early stage you know model was was great I mean I think we think it was spot on and um, so, you know, the, I think what ended up, what that did is it provided you good feedback. You know, there was a couple of changes that you made out of it. But, but really to see how it, it changed users' behavior on it, and, and you, know, you didn't mention it in your presentation, but you had mentioned it to us earlier, the, the fact that there were people waiting in line to actually try this thing, I mean, to us kind of has some market implications for, what's that? You tried it five times? No, you didn't try it. Yeah, the same people tried it five times. Thanks. <laughs> Did you want to do this? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so you know, we show, you showed that the, it changed the experience and people were interested in it. Um, and so, for that reason, we're interested in funding the inventory and, and building that next phase out and, and helping you kind of take this to the next, next phase of, of the testing. Yes. Congratulations, congratulations. I'm, I'm, I'm going to... Well, I want to chime in yeah, on that go, one. I think what's go. interesting about the Marcus Ski, I keep saying Marcus Ski, um, is it's a simple product. Uh, 
if you guys have seen the samples, if you can't go and kind of touch and feel it, it's a rough sample. I'm not making fun of it. I know you guys have aspirations to make it thinner and lighter and all that kind of stuff. Um, action sports is super tough. Uh, when the snowboard came out, it was super silly. In fact, it's got a really, you know, a lot of history here in West Michigan, actually, the, the snowboard itself. But defining a new category is what is an exponential improvement. This isn't a slalom ski and it's not a wakeboard, it's the attempt at a brand new type of board. You know, in surfing you've got short boarding and long boarding and then there was the fun board that came out. That was a great way to learn how to surf and that industry, that little middle area grew and it was massive. And um, I just kind of commend you guys on figuring out how to do this in the winter like, like you know, he was saying and uh, we'll see what happens next. And this is an interesting one where we're actually funding product that's going to hit the market in spring. We're all going to find out what's going to happen with this thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and. Uh, how, how much did putting our logo on one of the boards play into the decision? Zero. <laughs> okay. It looks cool, though. Good, good. So don't take that as a tip. Um, all right. So uh, real quick, before we take off here, the next update night, we do this each month. Uh, it's the fourth Thursday of every month, unless it's not, um, usually because there's a holiday there. Uh, but the next one will be March 28th. And we'll be back here in this space. It'll be you know, probably in the neighborhood of eight more teams doing the same thing uh, that we've done tonight. And we hope to see you there. So thank you all for coming out. And please applaud our teams again. <laughs> and it, you know, if you've still got a drink ticket, feel free to stick around for a little while and, uh, and hang out. Thanks again. Yay, panel. Something's always coming. You can hear it in the ground. It's like this in Yeah, yeah. yeah we got, we, we, you know, scripted that. I mean, look, 720. Derek, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's, it, oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm always, uh, I'm, I'm so concerned. I do more sweating. Yeah. You just sweat. I know. But I mean, mostly it's like because I'm hot. That's why it's kind of funny. But I mean, I, yeah, I try to like, it seems like things can get so heavy so quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sometimes you get a crowd that's willing to laugh. Yeah. You know, and it's tough when they're not. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to reach for down real deep and just be good at it.